now that we've covered the basic features, which are very limited, let's talk about the cool stuff. These are the advanced features. And so I'll talk about all the advanced features. We may not get through them all today. We'll definitely get through them all by next time. So it turns out that the, uh, the completable future class has a very large surface area. There are like 60 plus methods in it. And it's easy to see the thing and just get intimidated and go, I don't want to use this abstraction. It's too big. That was actually my first reaction when I saw it. I was like, what the heck is going on here? Um, and so it's easier to break it all down into little pieces, and we'll talk about them one at a time. So we'll start talking about factory methods, which, as you can see, are a pretty small part of the whole thing. And uh, we'll talk about what they do. And what they do is they initiate asynchronous computations. That's what the factory methods do. And there are four of them, and they're used to start these computations. Now, these four methods can be split up a couple different ways. So one way you can split them up is, do they return a value or not? Or do they just run computations in the background that are expected to have some kind of side effect? So it turns out that some of the methods return values, in particular the ones that are called supply async. So there's a pair of methods called supply async, and these allow two-way calls that return values. And they take a supplier that will be the thing that provides the information, uh, and then they return a completable future to whatever the result is for this kind of thing. The nice thing about this is it allows you to pass parameters to the call and also get a value back. So it's essentially a two-way call. So here is a simple example. This is something that's a, just a variant of what we saw before. This is going to use supply async in order to multiply these two big fractions. And the result will come back as a big fraction, but it comes back as a completable future to a big fraction. So supply async is a very important method. You will use it all over the place in a programming assignment 3, 3A, 3B. So supply async is what's used to start things off in the background. And what it does, of course, is it's going to run things in the fork join pool. OK, the parameters are passed as so-called effectively final objects. So see, here's f1 and f2. These come from up here. These are outside of the scope of the lambda expression. But they're what are called effectively final because we don't change them anywhere. So they're, they're bound, and we can use their values here without having to worry about them being changed because they don't get set anywhere. So that's good. Supply async is essentially a more concise version of something called callable, which comes from the Java executor framework. The second form, which we're not going to focus on, I'm just telling you about because it's useful to know as a, just to make you a little smarter, is something called run async. And this enables one-way calls via runnables. So unlike the two-way calls where you get a result back, the one-way calls just take in something and don't give a result back directly. They have to have some kind of other side effect. So here's another way to do this. This is using run async, which is the, uh, which is the call that runs in the background. And as you can see, that's going to multiply these things together, and it's going to do a print statement to print the result. So the result's still printed out. It just doesn't come back as a return value. And as you can see here, void is not a return value. It's a void, right? It's the non-value. So runnables don't, runnable and Run async don't give values back. Now, the other way to look at this is that the async functionality for all these methods can run or does run in it somewhere in a thread pool. And there's two different ways to do this. You can either use the default pool, which is what, you, what we've been showing so far, where you don't actually give an explicit uh, executor. Or you can give an executor, and then it'll run in whatever thread pool you designate. So you can take control over the pool that runs it. And there's pros and cons of each approach. OK, so let's take a look at how we might actually use this stuff. Well, this is essentially a variant of the example we looked at before, except now, rather than using thread and starting a thread and running and so on, we're going to use a completable future. And this is also a little cleaner, because as you'll see in a second, we don't have to make the completable future first with an empty value and then complete it later. All we do is we simply call supply async. And that runs this lambda expression somewhere in the background in the fork join pool, as we show up here. And that then runs. These computations run concurrently with whatever those computations are. And we block until the thing is done. Notice how there's no threads used in this example at all. 
it's being done implicitly by having this lambda expression given by supply async, the factory method, which takes the lambda expression and queues it up to run in a task in the fork join pool, which eventually runs on a thread. But we don't have to explicitly program the Java thread. Okay, so that's kind of the end of the, the quick overview of factory methods.